we're now going to sort of focus a little more narrowly on this question of immigrants as individuals and communities who experience profound trauma and who also come with lots of uh, built-in and built-up resiliency uh, and how we understand those issues as journalists. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Denise Zayaberta uh, talking about trauma resiliency and psychosocial support. Um, she's going to cover a wide range of issues that I think will be very helpful to us trying to be culturally competent journalists to understand what we're looking at, what kinds of stories we're telling. Um, again, I'm not going to do the long bio. You've got it. But uh, Denise is a licensed clinical psychologist with 20 years of experience working with multilingual, multicultural communities. She's the founding director of the Liberty Center for Survivors of Torture. Uh, and she's currently the director of mental health at the Latin American Community Center as well. Come talk. We'll take it from there. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and I really, I do want to start, first of all, thanking you from our communities. Um, you have the power to do something that I don't have the power to do, which is to take the stories that I hear every single day and that I experience in a very different way, and you can make them a part of general knowledge in the US public. And that has an extremely pertinent piece of power for our communities. Because those of us who are doing the work are really busy doing the work. Um, and we have incredible experiences. We have individuals in front of us whose stories need to be told for a variety of reasons. Um, for advocacy, for information about their country of origin, to increase tolerance, to do things that we can't do sitting in our offices and running around um, the way that we do working with individuals and communities. And I thank you very much for taking the time and being interested enough that you guys are willing to have the knowledge to be able to do that well. Because the other thing that is important is to do that well. Um, as you heard, I have spent a lot of time working with survivors of war trauma and torture, both nationally and internationally. So I do work here um, in Philadelphia with asylum seekers, in Wilmington with new immigrant populations, and then a good half of my time is spent internationally in the Middle East, West Africa, um, and in Latin America. So I know the transference of those stories um, and how important it is for them to be told. So I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart that you're here um, and that you're willing to spend this time to learn to be culturally competent storytellers for our communities. I'm going to give you a wide range of stuff. I was asked to do a wide range of stuff, which is either good news or bad news. Um, and I did. I will have to apologize. I just came back from China about 48 hours ago, so I'm still a little off in terms of timing. Um, so I, you will either get a very hyped up or a very slow down. We'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, stop me as we go along, and we will also have time at the end. Uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit different than um, uh, your previous uh, presentation. I'm going to talk much less about research, much less about um, sort of the book piece and touch more on so what do you do when you're sitting and across from somebody and to try to get that experience to you and what that feels like the per person for the person you're interviewing and what that feels like for the community and how you can best work with that so I'm going to stay away from the book stuff you guys can google everything I happen to know that um, so you, you don't need that as much but hopefully the, the the translation piece will be more helpful so the first question when we talk about new immigrants is why they're here. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions in the US population about people coming for a better life and for a bigger screen TV and those kinds of things. And I want you to think about, as you tell those stories, why. Why you would leave the place where you are safe, the sounds that you know, your family, your degree, every piece of power that you have to come to another place. Why would you do that? And I can assure you that is very rarely for adventure, unless you're between the ages of about 18 to 21, or the bigger screen TV. 
So all of the immigrants that are here are here for a reason. And that reason is generally heartbreaking. And that reason is generally bigger than they can explain. And that reason is also generally not allowable under current US immigration law and policy. And that's the first question to understand as you begin to walk into the world of new immigrants. Almost all newcomers who are here in the United States have suffered trauma. Either that's the reason why they came, and we'll talk about those reasons, through the journey to come here, because unless you have money and power, which most of my communities don't, you didn't get here on a plane drinking a can of Coke. So you came here through tubes or tunnels or lying or hiding or a plain belly or some other way that you can't even describe and that has its own trauma as well. And then you have the trauma of being here and we'll talk about that a little bit. Almost all newcomers have had a struggle to achieve naturalization and I know it's funny, newcomer populations know much more about the US immigration system than most US citizens. So when I go out and do these presentations to general population, and I'm assuming that you guys know a little bit more than that, I get questions like, why don't they just come legally? Why don't they just get that paper? Um, and you cannot imagine the questioning look on the face of a new immigrant. And I've had clients, actually I've had clients who have gone to immigration and said, I'm here illegally, I just need those papers. And then of course got into expedited deportation, so you can imagine how that went. Um, Everybody had a struggle to get here and to become naturalized. Individuals who are not US citizens have differential rights to public services and benefits. And one of the things that, that kind of uh, stopped my heart as I was listening to the, the conversation before is when we talk about mental health services for new immigrant populations, what wasn't mentioned is they are absolutely not eligible and not funded for any of those services. So the reason that they're not getting those services has less to do with taboo and less to do with their resistance and more to do with the fact that they have absolutely no eligibility to pay for those services. And because of that, there are not programs in the United States that are training bilingual, bicultural professionals in providing culturally competent mental health services because there's no money in it. Because as an immigrant, even one with a temporary visa, you are not eligible for Medicaid, you are not eligible for Medicare, you are not eligible for any state-funded service. So as you know, the way that our systems work, if you are not eligible and there's no funding in it, it is unlikely that schools are putting out bilingual bicultural professionals, they are not building clinics for bilingual bicultural services, and individuals, even if they want that service, have to beg and barter to be able to get those very needed services. The um, fourth item, of course, is that individuals who are not US citizens have limited civil rights, period, end of conversation. Immigrants are not the same as everybody else. We are not all here holding hands, singing Kumbaya with the same rights, we're just not. And that is something that is known to immigrant populations and obviously affects issues around mental health, but also around their ability to talk with you and to talk with the folks around them. So if you can imagine the situation, I had a young gentleman last year, one of the top five in his class, had been bought from Ecuador <coughs> when he was about two years old. Gay activist in his community brilliant young man, was the same, sat in those classes, heard the same story, you can be president, you can be anything until graduation day. And then he was not eligible to go to college, he was not eligible for any funding, and he was an openly out gay activist in a very conservative Latino community where his only job opportunity was going to be working in a meat packing factory with other immigrants who were not going to be as open about his choices, his activism, as he had been taught in US schools for 12 years that the world would be. The bottom line is immigrants do not have the same civil rights. Up until the point that you are a US citizen, you can still be detained at any point 
for any reason without legal representation, you can be deported for any infraction at the discretion of a U.S. immigration judge at any point. Domestic violence is an immediately deportable crime. Being caught with um, a joint. I had a, a young gentleman from Jamaica who he had no idea he was an immigrant. His mom brought him over as a baby. He had no idea he was not uh, documented until he went, again, a high school kid, went to a keg party. Not, not unusual for a high school kid. His mom, being a good immigrant, was worried about where he was, sent his little brother to pick him up. The little brother happened to be there at the time when the police came. He was charged with, um, what was it, delinquency of a minor, which was kind of funny because he did not really intend for the eight-year-old to be there. Um, rest of his friends got skirted away with, a, I think, maybe a drug and alcohol class. He was put into deportation proceedings, deported back to a country where he no longer had any relatives, where he had absolutely no connections, um, and where he had never lived, as an, as a, not even as a child. He came as, a, as an infant. Um, it is not that life is not the same for new immigrants as it is for other folks. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the issue of newcomers having difficulty identifying mental health symptoms, being hesitant, hesitant to seek services, and may discontinue services prematurely due to cultural and environmental factors. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, again, looking at your symptoms, giving the priority. If you are the only person here and you are working in a job where you know that there are five other people waiting for your job the day that you miss work, prioritizing the way that you feel, if it's not some part of your body that is gonna fall off and the next day, it is unlikely that you have the time or the resources to be able to do that. Um, and that's, those are some of the obstacles that our, our folks have as they look at mental health issues um, as within that new immigrant context. Culture, of course, establishes what mental health is. I'm not sure how much time that you've really thought about what culture is, because culture is the piece of you that you never question. Culture is the understanding of how you breathe, how you live, what's right, what's wrong, who you marry, how you spend your money. All of those things are spoon fed to you per a culturally specific perspective. And I think, and I am in like WHYY, so I'm gonna be quiet. The, the idea of, of Sesame Street, where we all hold hands and we're all the same, is not true. It just isn't. We have different beliefs, very different beliefs about the world. And eating enough tacos and wearing, you know, you're going to Chinese New Year are beautiful things, but they don't even become close to looking at what culture is and how deeply it affects the way that we look at things. And that's not only true for the host culture, you asking those questions, but also for the folks who are sitting across from you and answering those questions. Culture determines how we define, of course, health, mental health, right and wrong. So the idea of even knowing what a symptom is, what is a need for mental health, what the body versus the mind is, is completely different depending the cultures that we're working with. The separation between religion, society, Family is completely different depending on the community. The differentiation between individual versus family is completely different. And I can say that a million times, but until you are up in front of it, it is very hard for you to, to, to get your mouth around. And the only reason that I'm an expert is because I spend so much time in these communities and I've, been, I've made so many mistakes that I can tell you how deeply culture affects every single thing we do and every single perspective that we put forth. Cultures, of course, are very different um, in looking at mental health services as well, even looking at what is mental health. What is mental health versus physical health versus spirituality? Um, and depending in the community that I'm working in on any given moment, those things may be completely intertwined. Those things may be completely separate. Um, but you have to know that to be able to sort of pull out 
what makes sense for that individual within that culture. We're going to talk a little bit about the three levels of trauma that new immigrants almost always have. And that has to do with the country of origin, and, and this was specifically around um, torture and trauma, but doesn't have to be around torture. The country of origin trauma, <coughs> the flight trauma, and the trauma of being a new immigrant. Systems of oppression are set up purposefully to change people's internal experience, social experience, and also spiritual experience. So when you are living in a system where oppression is a piece of it, it changes not only your physiological, the way that you deal with the world, the way that you deal with other people, um, but also the way that you deal with institutions and even the way that you deal with spirituality. And I'll give you some examples. And, and, it, and it does that on purpose. It does that because there's no other way to manage populations that are really based on communal living than to make that kind of break and make that make sense in the lives of, of those individuals. And, and I'll talk to you about um, Mexico and, and Liberia. So when I have, a, I have a small son who travels with me everywhere, who just came back from China with me. Um, when he was a very small baby, we were in Mexico in the subway. And he was a very United States born baby and didn't like to be hot. And it was like a 200 degrees in the subway in Mexico. Mexico is an extraordinarily um, close knit community. They don't need child protective and I'll explain to you why. So I took off his socks and no more than five grandmothers walking down the aisle were like, he needs socks. Can I buy you socks? Can you please put socks on that child? That child is going to die of bad winds because he has no socks on his feet. At the same time, actually six months later, we were traveling through Liberia um, during the time of the elections of Ellen Sheriff, the first female president in, in the continent of Africa. And we were driving and there was a pothole probably the size of this room, the, the, the piece where you're sitting at. And we had a very competent driver and we had to get from point A to point B in the middle of a, a militarized zone. And there were no less than 30 grandfatherly, uncle-y types sitting around discussing how, the, who had never probably driven a car in their lives, discussing how we were going to get point, from point A to point B. Everybody is in your business. Everybody in those communities, everything is at a community event. That's really inconvenient for folks who are trying to oppress a, a population because it's really hard to oppress people when you have nosy grandmothers around all the time asking questions. Unfortunately, in both of those situations, both of those communities have gotten to the point where they don't check in on each other, where those ugly vans can come in and wreak havoc in the house next door and you can hear screaming and you can hear gunshots. Nobody calls the police because of oppression, because of torture, because of leaving bodies outside, because of spreading fear within that society. What that does, unfortunately, is not only damage the individual who's damaged, but damage that society. So be people begin to look at each other very differently. So instead of saying that baby needs socks on, they begin to step back and say, hmm, who can I say something to? What is my belief? And there begins to be these separations between communities. My family happens to be from Guatemala. And during the wars in Guatemala, there was so much unsaid between the lines where you could say, at that point, the, the government of Rios Montt was evangelizing the country because basically Catholic priests were beginning to become aware and be on the side of the poor. And they, the, they would be able to say, did you go to mass today? If you went to mass today, that meant you were a communist. That meant you were on the side of the popular movements. As opposed to, oh, I went to an aculto, which is an evangelical-based kind of service. So there are all of these subtleties within countries of, of origin, which folks are not aware of at all, but affect both the individual, the community, their belief about trusting each other, and their belief about trusting institutions.
So all of these things are going on in country of origin. There, people are living in fear. They're hiding. There's high levels of vigilance. There are detentions. There's societal sanctions. There are threats against self and family. There's torture. So folks are walking around with all of this knowledge and all of that trauma, depending on how much they were particularly involved. We have children even who will say, no, I didn't experience any trauma. Oh yeah, when I walked to school, we walked over those bodies. The school was closed because of bombings. We were not able to get health care because we were in an occupied zone and that wasn't allowed. So folks are walking around with levels of trauma that they might not even define as trauma themselves. Then, of course, you have the, the trauma of flight. And I can tell you honestly, unless you have a lot of money and a lot of power, there is no easy way from there to here. There just is no easy way. So there's questions of documentation. There's the fear of going to the embassy. There's the crazy things that you have to do to get a visa to enter this country like you cannot even believe. There is the fleeing specifically because you're targeted or because your community is targeted. They're the people that you left behind. There's how you got to that safe country. Um, is your story even legitimate? Are your papers legitimate? Is anything about you legitimate at this point? And how do you begin to explain how traumatizing it is to live an identity that's not even yours? Did you get caught? Did you get, were you detained? Um, there's a fear of the future as you're coming here. What's going to happen to me? Um, and there's a fear of, am I ever going to get over what happened in my country of origin? And then there's just the travel conditions that people are under. Because again, they're not coming. They're not buying a ticket, getting on the plane, and getting off the plane. They're hiding in the desert. They're walking through the bush. They're um, paying coyotes to bring them across. And they're stuck in different places in the universe. So the, tr the journey itself is traumatic even if there was no trauma to begin with. The last piece is immigration trauma. So people are coming even though they're maybe not coming just for a better life, they're coming because they don't have a choice, but there is sort of this high expectation because we have a great system of propaganda in the world that they are coming to the, the capital of peace and justice and, and all things good. Um, and then they get here and they realize, and they turn on actually the news and they see Hazleton's, or um, uh, oh, the place in Pennsylvania, Hazleton, right? Yeah, um, saying immigrants go home. They turn on the TV and see people being killed. They listen to their kids' stories about school where they're being beat up. They have the experience of having to work 24 hours a day to survive. Um, and then they're having PTSD symptoms. And the last thing they want to feel at that point is trauma, is that feeling of anxiety, is that feeling of hypervigilance. Because what they're saying is, now I really am crazy. Those people have won. And what am I going to do now? There are language barriers, obviously cultural differences to the point that you can't imagine, um, isolation survivor's guilt. Why am I here? And so-and-so didn't make it. Why am I here? And to be honest, our, our families are not so great about uh, dealing with that because they work it. So it's like, you got there, you need to not forget us, you need to send us money, you need to not, you know, you need to continue to take care of the people that you left at home. Um, and then, of course, there's just that straight economic need. The idea, of course, that new immigrants are coming to the country to stale benefits, as you guys know, is totally not true because new immigrants, even when they have papers, are not eligible for any benefits. No cash benefits, no mental health benefits. The only thing they are eligible for is emergency Medicaid, and that is if they are in need of a service to help them not die. To the point where they are stable, that emergency Medicaid gets cut off. In terms of mental health services, of course, there is the other piece that most of the communities where our folks are coming from are not oriented to mental health services. So they may be unfamiliar with the structure and parameters of mental health services. They will differ in taboos around symptoms and treatment. 
Um, confidentiality really and truly does not exist in most of the communities that we deal with. So even though we can tell somebody a million times that their information is going to be held co uh, confidential, they are not going to believe that. Like I actually go to the closet and show them where the locked files are. I tell them even if their mother calls, I can't give information. And to be honest, within our community, within the Latino communities, I do have mothers and sisters and brothers calling and saying, my sister, brother, or son needs your services. And by the way, tell me what they said. Um, and they, they also need a treatment that includes methods and expectations for change, mutually determined treatment goals, um, and basic life needs. Because the bottom line is, you cannot talk about your trauma or deal with your trauma if you are still hungry, tired, and don't have a safe place to be. And that's where most of our new immigrant communities are. Um, and that's why, to be honest, we don't even suggest that people deal with their trauma, get trauma treatment until they've been here for a while and they're safe enough to do that. We do do therapy, but we, are, we don't do to the point where they are, um, where they're opening those trauma wounds because it is just too early. In terms of building those relationships, and these are things that, that go with you as well. What we do need to, to, to talk about is in the rest of the world, we are not all the same. So they are, the relationships are hierarchical, generally speaking. They are based on respect, um, non-judgment, um, encouraging, genuine, non-dependent, and within professional boundaries. All of those things are really important. I know I don't have a ton of time. Obstacles to treatment within newcomers, um, obviously language access, payment access, um, community discouragement of disclosure, reputation of the agency and the community of origin, the voluntary nature of the participation, um, hours, transportation, and child care, and then the lack of the understanding, why am I going to go to a mental health service? Why is it going to make a difference in our lives? Um, and I, I'll do real quick these last three sides. Trust is a luxury that most newcomers don't have. So the first thing that you do is to talk to people. You say, what is your name? When you ask me that question, automatically I'm thinking, which name? My religious name, the name on my papers, the name that my parents gave me. Um, automatically, I'm on guard. And automatically, I'm in a position where I have to lie to you. And that makes my life difficult and your job much more difficult. New immigrants many times have been lied to by governments, institutions, and trusted professionals including journalists, including, social, including psychologists, including medical doctors. And when that is your life story, you have to understand how difficult it is then to, to bring your story out, to, tell, to give you any grain of the truth. Um, new immigrants are many times given uh, by non-governmental organization impossible tasks to achieve that make no sense in their cultural context. So if I have a group of children and I'm in a refugee camp and they say, are all of these children yours? And all of those children are mine in my heart. But some of them were born to my sister who was, who was killed in a bombing. And then they asked me to show a paper to show that that child is my child. When I've changed that child's diapers and taken care of them when they have malaria, you have to imagine the, the and of course the likely, where am I gonna get a paper saying that that child is my child? Um, so again, they, they, they look at institutions through a different lens. And the other thing is survival is the main goal. And when survival is your main goal, it is very difficult. Um, tr truth isn't important, to be honest. And that's not because they're refugees, and that's not because they come from a culture. That's any of us. When your survival is put on the line, telling the truth is not important. And that becomes a difficult job, I think, as a journalist as well. Because there are people who need to tell their stories, and the story needs to get heard. Um, but their definition of truth may not be the same as your definition of truth, which is why you need to be really careful about the stories that you tell. Guilt feeds in the same way. So folks, there's no way to get from there to here without stepping over and leaving people behind. And that becomes a difficult piece of that story. And things I don't want to share with you. As a smiling United States citizen, I don't want to bring that story into you and feel like I'm infecting you in some way. Um, and then the feeling of shame, um, that somehow, because if you're a thinking person, you have to make sense of the crazy things that have happened to you. So you have two choices. You believe that the world is a terrible, horrible place, and terrible, horrible things just happen. And those folks don't survive and don't get here, because that's called clinical depression, and you stay in bed. What you do then is to make up a story that makes sense to you. 
Um, and usually those stories have to do with, well, if I was a different person, if I wasn't so much of an activist, if I didn't stick my nose in where I didn't believe, if I had prayed more, these bad things wouldn't have happened to me, but it's usually internal. So folks are walking around with the feeling that everything that have happened to them in some way is their fault. Um, and that is something that we, we have to overcome in terms of them telling their stories, um, but also in terms of their, their dealing with the world and being, feeling like they deserve um, to feel better and to feel different. And I know we're, we're the time, I don't know what I skipped. Again, time is more limited than we would like, but that's the nature of, of the thing. That was fabulous. Thank you. Um, so as you've gone about your work um, dealing with all these issues, and particularly maybe because you're dealing with survivors of torture and other human rights violations, you have had clients who've ended up de dealing with the press in one way or another. Mm -hmm. interactions Absolutely. With, interactions with journalists. When those interactions have gone well, why have they gone well? And when they've gone badly, why have they gone badly? I think um, a lot of times we have to remember that the individuals that are here are not just victims. They were powerful people in their communities of origin. And they have a reason for being here. And they have a reason for telling their story. Um, a lot of times where the confusion has been is that their purpose for telling their story is not always understood or respected by the journalists. Um, that has been a big problem. So someone has told their story with a very specific perspective and a very specific agenda, mm -hmm. um, needing their story to be told um, because they believe that that's going to lead to a difference in community perception about their, um, about their particular situation, about their particular country, um, and then having their words in, in what they believe to be mis misinterpreted or misunderstood yeah. or misrepresented. Um, so we do a lot of work with having um, people have the right to relook at work, which I know is difficult for journalists, um, but really important for survivors of torture and war trauma to be able to have the power to. What you lose when you're traumatized, what you lose when you're tortured, what you lose when you're a victim of war trauma is power. Um, and a lot of times folks will look at, they will go into a situation looking at journalists thinking that that's a way to get power back mm -hmm. um, and really end up feeling victimized again. The other thing of course is this, the feeling of interrogation. So when folks have been interrogated previously um, and they're asked questions in a way that feels like they are closed in, that feels like you're questioning their credibility, that feels like um, they're forceful. And, and absolutely you have to do that because as I said, folks are also not in a position always to be honest, mm -hmm. um, that that begins to feel traumatizing to them as well. And then we did have questions earlier about the idea of the retelling of the story, just retelling and retelling and retelling the story, um, that becomes problematic. I think as a, as a provider, the other thing that sometimes becomes frustrating is journalists um, really soliciting us when there's a high drama need. So something happens and, they, and you guys want, and I, I get it, you're, you're, that's, that's part of it, you want the, you want the drama. Um, but not really wanting to cover those long-term stories. So the story is not always, you know, um, victims of trafficking, for example, we have contracts around victims of trafficking, and everybody wants a story about a 15-year-old prostitute. Um, and what we have is 40-year-old labor trafficked um, individuals who come here who are, um, I can't think of an English word, engañado, who are tricked, who are put into different kinds of situations. Those are the stories that sometimes need to be reported as opposed to the, we really don't have that many 15-year-old prostitutes, not that they don't exist. They, I mean, the majority of cases are 40-year-old um, laborers who are trafficked. So those kinds of things I think have gotten in the way in terms of our good relationships with journalists. So one of the things, one of the ways that journalists could be relating to you is not only as a bridge to clients in individual cases, or, but to actually where the story really is. I mean, what you're saying there is, guys, the story while trafficking of 15-year-olds trafficking of is a important and nothing one wants to neglect. The big neglected story, the one that's not being told, is this other. Absolutely. And what I would say to you guys is use your community connections. We are here, um, but we don't deal with... Um, one is that we're, we're overworked and we're dealing with five different hats at all times. But if you have an ongoing relationship with your community centers around different communities that you're working with, 
ongoing relationships, you know what the issues are for them, you know where they can help you, then we can really hold hands because we need you. We are advocacy um, services amongst everything else. We need our stories to be told and you need, to, and you need the access to our people and our drama and, and all of those things as well. But it has to be an ongoing relationship. One is around trust because, of course, as, as advocates, all of 90% of my clientele are undocumented. I'm not putting their stories out there for them to be picked up and deported at any given moment. Um, a lot of my folks are in very fragile situations internationally. So I need to know who I'm working with. I need to know who you are. I need to know what your perspective is. I need to know that you're not going to take our information and, and twist it and so, twirl it so around. So for reporters taking the time to invest in long-term relationships of trust with folks like you, is a key part of getting access to issues and getting access to people. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. For the room. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I would love to hear your thoughts about how we deal better with the journalistic end products of reporting on these communities um, with, you know, with the people we're reporting on, particularly if they haven't been in positions of power where they came from. None of the refugees or asylum seekers I've reported on have ever had any experience of a free press or you know, much notion of what it could mean to have the story of their trauma told. And in addition to not wanting to re-traumatize them by asking those questions, I also want to be better about sort of helping them to understand what the consequences could be of having it out there. Oh. Love well, to hear your thoughts. And I can tell you what we've done um, is sort of a multiple process um, in terms of ensuring always that, that, that our clientele, that our part, and we don't call them clients, we call them participants, that, that um, the folks that participate in our programs um, maintain power at every point. So when we know that there's a journalistic opportunity out there, what we do is we say there's a journalistic opportunity. Um, because they are hesitant to say no to somebody who's offering them a service, we say, if you're interested, you need to come to us. We're not going to ask you to do that. We do talk generally about what are some of the benefits of that. You know, would it be beneficial to your immigration case to have your case reported? What are the negative consequences to that? Um, what you have to know is when folks are in the process, process of asylum, their asylum file goes back with them to their country of origin if they're deported. So anything they say will absolutely be used against them. And we have a lot of our folks don't make it out of the airports um, after they've been deported because that information gets reported back to the country of origin as well. So we talk about the positive benefits of, of telling their story and also some of the, the consequences that might happen. The other thing that we have them do is after the interview, um, obviously they have support during the interview, they have a therapist with them during the interview, but also at the end, they get to be your final editor. And to be honest, even as a forensic evaluator, I do full psychological um, evaluations for people to take to court. My clients and their attorneys get to look at, nobody else gets to do this, gets to look at my evaluation and edit it. Now, there's stuff I can't take out, like if they say I didn't, you know, but for the most part, they maintain the power, and if they say, I don't want that in, it gets taken out. Um, all of those things are, are helpful. How much of a sort of a Surgeon General's warning label do you think journalists should provide? Should, should we be saying, you know, if I interview you and if this story works, it may be helpful, but it may also do X, Y, and Z. How much should we be doing that? I I think that's. I think it's fair. I think it's 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 open disclosure. I think if you guys don't, with our participants, we do that for them. If you're dealing with folks who are cold, who don't have a service system around them, I think that it's your ethical responsibility to do that because it can and will be used against them. Yeah, I um, am actually Paisana. Um, thinking about uh, something that Aldia News, um, we did uh, during the genocide trial in Guatemala. We spoke to a lot of people, Guatemalans in the Philadelphia area, and found that a lot of them are still incredibly fearful of speaking out. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it seems odd since it's 36 years ago, but one of the things that, that happened is that a, a number of people got put on Facebook names, uh, uh, you know, Facebook pages. I'm wondering if you can tell us how to deal with you know, um, a highly globalized world where our stories can, in fact, impact um, family back home, can have really um, lethal consequences. 
One is, I think, and the first and the biggest part is to take that seriously. So when I was, when I was a young, young, young um, activist and we were working with Salvadorans and they were like, oh no, there's you know, secret police here and they're going to tell and we can't tell your stories. And I was like, oh, they have PTSD. Until people in Los Angeles were killed by Salvadoran um, military. And we said, oh, they're not kidding. And I, you know, I, I laugh a little bit. Um, I work in West Africa, I work in, in the Middle East, and on my phone on any given day, somebody sitting in my office, the story goes back to Monrovia and back to my office or back to Ramallah and back to my office within, you know, like depending on time change, a seven hour, whatever has happened in my office is already known globally. Um, so one is to take it seriously. It really does exist. Um, our communities are really small. There are still, um, you know, there are, what is it, 27 Liberian organizations here in Philadelphia and they don't talk to each other. And there's a reason for that because people still get killed because people still, and I'm thinking in Guatemala, in Guatemala people still get killed. It's not, it is not over, it's not over. Um, so you need to take that very seriously and when folks bring that up, you need to maintain their confidentiality um, as much as possible. Um, I think you, you as much as you want to prove the credibility of your story, you take away those identifiers. You make it impossible for people to find out who has said what and why. And I think we go back and forth because some of us who have been here for a while get very big mouths and we get very comfortable with, with telling our stories um, until somebody goes home or something happens at home and we realize we're not as safe as, as we thought we were. So I, do, I think as much as you can, um, just to protect um, your, your sources. And the other thing is to take it completely seriously. Um, it is not a joke. Is it, it isn't them feeling paranoid. It really does exist. The world is extraordinarily small, um, despite how big it is. And for our immigrant communities, where the communities are small, um, folks really do know each other and really can pinpoint back who said what and why. Um, so it's really, really important, um, that, that piece of protection, um, incredibly so, incredibly so. Yeah, Some, someone else. Uh, any other questions? Skip. Uh, I have a couple of different things that have been occurring to me. Uh, first, I guess this goes back a little bit to the previous session, but it's relevant to this too, of uh, cultural competence. I think it's useful to remember that if you're interviewing an immigrant or a refugee or almost any of the people in this world that we're talking about, the chances are very, very good that they are about 100 times more culturally competent than you are and about 1,000 times more culturally competent than a mainstream American <coughs> sitting across from you being interviewed. Absolutely. And I've always sort of worked on the theory, I mean, you can't become instantly competent Anyway, you know, I mean, I, I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking about those handbooks that, the, that the, the military services pass out about good manners to Afghans or something like that. I remember the Vietnamese, don't touch their heads. They don't, like to, they don't like to be touched on their head and that kind of stuff, which is nonsense. I, I always thought it paid off much more to be polite in my own language, in my own culture, and people really do know that. They don't miss that. They understand that you're a foreigner, that you're not familiar with the gestures or whatever. Uh, second thing, I wanted to take you on on the issue of prior review or editing. I, I think this is something that a journalist cannot accept. I think that when we're interviewing somebody in a sensitive story, it could be damaging. We have a very, very strong obligation to keep stopping, saying, all right, can I use this? And do you, you, know, you really want this? And to explain to them, especially their people, as someone said, who have no experience, they've never been a news subject. They're not a senator or a, a county commissioner. Uh, and to make very, very clear what, you, you know, what you're going to use, what you're going to say, explain what your story is, why you are reporting it, and that you want to do it. But once that's done, you can't let them take out stuff that is valid that they said. You can't let them edit behind you. That puts you in an impossible ethical situation. It might, might or might not happen, but you can't take the chance of them changing something that would make the story wrong. 
And people do that all the time. And, and, I would, and, I, and I gratefully agree and disagree at the same time, which is to say, I know that it's, I write forensic avows, believe me, it's not easy on my end either to have, you know, I'm a doctor, to have somebody say, no, I, you know, I'd take that out. Um, it's extremely humbling. At the same time, and, and I agree, and there are some things I, they tell me take that out, I'm like, you know what, then you're not gonna be able to use this report because there's some things oh, I can't exactly. take out. Um, at the same so time, not giving them the power. at the same time as an activist, I can tell you for somebody who's had absolutely no power over what that story is, um, it's incredibly opening for them. It's very helpful. The other thing is when you're dealing with folks who've been traumatized, they're not the best witnesses. They're not the best storytellers. Because again, they're, they're, um, they're spending 90% of their time trying not to think about the thing that they, they have to talk to you about. So it's not unlikely for them to be able to say, oh, I forgot, or oh, you know, I was confused about, or what you have to know is that, that sort of zoom, zoom thing that happens, right? So when they're talking about this story, their heart is going like this, they're trying to breathe, their brain, what happens is your frontal lobe completely turns off, right? So you're not the best storyteller, and, and part of it is, is having them refine that, and that happens to them on the stand as well, and I spend a lot of my time explaining that to judges, why their stories change, why it doesn't make sense. Um, so I, I, I know that it's a difficult, and, I, and I, would, I would say is, you know, like, so is there a, a pre-draft draft? Or, you know, I, I understand it's not an easy, believe well, me, I tell this to psychologists, you want to tell a bunch of doctors, yeah, that your, client, your patient is going to go back and look at your eval and decide whether it's approved or not. They, they don't like it. And, and I would say that, in, I mean, in journalism, this is actually a, a bit of contended terrain right now, too. There, is, there are arguments about reading quotes back and showing parts of stories and things that are going on within journalism. Maybe it's a fabulous point, Skip, and maybe we should park it for now and bring it up when we do the, the journalism craft piece tomorrow. But it is it goes to this core question about power, doesn't right. it? And fi finding ways, if not that way, then finding other ways of giving people power and control in the course of the... Right, and I think, it, well, I think it hits three things. One is I do think it hits accuracy because people really in that moment of telling that story may or may not be accurate. Two, it goes to power in terms of being able to tell your story. But the other thing is I think it goes to the purpose of. Um, and you guys have an extraordinarily powerful purpose in the, in the story, um, and the, our folks who are telling their stories as well, so what is the purpose of telling the story? Um, and making sure that you're in agreement on that piece, and that, that's an, a, a whole other level that, that probably would need to be discussed. Can I respond to that? Well, I have to stop, <laughs> okay. I, we, we're gonna, I have to stop because we are a little bit over time, and in our next panel, one of our panels is also on an even more constricted time. So, um, Denise, thank you. Thank this you. This was great.